Hey, best class ever. It is time for chapter seven. Hope you enjoy. It's called The Golden Room. Mr. Burke had begun to repair the old Perkins place. After Christmas, Mrs. Burke was right in the middle of writing a book, so she wasn't available to help, which left Leslie the jobs of hunting and fetching. For all his smartness with politics and music, Mr. Burke was inclined to be absent-minded. He would put down the hammer to pick up the how-to book and then lose the hammer between there and the project he was working on. Leslie was good at finding things for him, and he liked her company as well. When she came home from school and on the weekends, he wanted her around. Leslie explained all this to Jess. Jess tried going to Terabithia alone, but it was no good. It needed Leslie to make the magic. He was afraid he would destroy everything by trying to force the magic on his own when it was plain that the magic was reluctant to come for him. If he went home, either his mother either his mother was after him to do some chore or Maybelle wanted him to play Barbie. Lord, he wished a million times he'd never helped buy that dumb doll. He'd no more than lie down on the floor to paint than Maybelle would be after him to put an arm back on or snap up a dress. Joyce Ann was worse. She got a devilish delight out of sitting smack down on his rump when he was stretched out working. If he yelled at her to get off, get off of him, she'd stick her index finger in the corner of her mouth and holler, which would, of course, crank up his mother. Jesse, Oliver, you leave that baby alone. What you mean lying there in the middle of the floor doing nothing anyway? Didn't I tell you I couldn't cook supper before you chopped wood for the stove? Sometimes he would sneak down to the old Perkins place and find Prince Tarion crying on the porch where Mr. Burke had exiled him. You couldn't blame the man. No one could get anything done with that animal grabbing his hand or jumping up to lick his face. He'd take P.T. for a romp in the Burke's upper field. If it was a mild day, Miss Bessie would be mooing nervously across from across the fence. She couldn't seem to get used to the yipping and snapping. Or maybe it was the time of year, the last dregs of winter spoiling the taste of everything. Nobody, human or animal, seemed happy. Here's the picture. Except Leslie. She was crazy about fixing up that old, broken down old wreck of a house. She loved being needed by her father. Half the time they were supposed to be working, they were just yakking away. She was learning, she related glowingly at recess, to understand her father. It had never occurred to Jess that parents were meant to be understood any more than the safe at the Millsburg First National was sitting around begging him to crack it. Parents were what they were. It wasn't up to you to try to puzzle them out. There was something weird about a grown man wanting to be friends with his own child. He ought to have friends his own age and let her have hers. Jess's feelings about Leslie's father poked up like a canker sore. You keep biting it and it gets bigger and bigger and worse instead of better. You spend a lot of time trying to keep your teeth away from it. Then sure as Christmas you forget the silly thing and chomp right down on it. Lord, that man got in his way. It even poisoned what time he did have with Leslie. She'd be sitting there bubbling away at recess and it would be almost like the old times. Then without warning she'd say, Bill thinks so and so. Chomp right down on the old sore. Finally, finally she noticed. It took her until February, and for a girl as smart as Leslie, that was a long, long time. Why don't you like Bill? Who said I didn't? Jess Aarons, how dumb do you think I am? Pretty dumb sometimes. But what he actually said was, what makes you think I don't like him? Well, you never come to the house anymore. At first, I thought it was something I'd done, but it's not that. You still talk to me at school. Lots of times I see you in the field playing with P.T., but you don't even come near the door. You're always busy. He was uncomfortably aware of how much he sounded like Brenda when he said this. Well, for spaghetti sauce, you could offer to help, you know. It was like all the lights coming back on after an electrical storm. Lord, who was the silly one? Still, it took him a few days to feel comfortable around Leslie's father. Part of the problem was he didn't know what to call him. Hey, he'd say, and both Leslie and her father would turn around. Uh, Mr. Burke? I wish you'd call me Bill, Jess. Yeah. He fumbled around with the name for a couple more days, but it came more easily with practice. It also helped to know some things that Bill, for all his brains and books, didn't know. 
Jess found he was really useful to him, not a nuisance to be tolerated or set out on the porch like P.T. You're amazing, Bill would say. Where did you learn that, Jess? Jess never quite knew how he knew things, so he'd shrug and let Bill and Leslie praise him to each other, through the work, though the work itself was praise enough. First, they ripped off the boards that covered the ancient fireplace, coming upon the rusty bricks like prospectors upon the mother load. Next, they got the old wallpaper off the living room wall, all five garish layers of it. Sometimes, as they lovingly patched and painted, they listened to Bill's records or sang, Leslie and Jess teaching Bill some of Mrs. Edmund's songs, and Bill teaching them some he knew. At other times, they would talk. Jess listened wonderingly as Bill explained things that were going on in the world. If Mama could hear him, she swear he was another Walter Cronkite instead of some hippie. All the Burks were smart. Not smart, maybe, about fixing things or growing things, but smart in a way Jess had never known real people, real life people to be. Like one day, while they were working, Judy came down and read out loud to them mostly poetry and some of it in Italian, which of course Jess couldn't understand, but he buried, it, buried his head in the rich sound of the words and let himself be wrapped warmly around in the feel of the Burke's brilliance. They painted the living room gold. Leslie and Jess had wanted blue, but Bill held out for gold, which turned out to be so beautiful that they were glad they had given in. The sun would slant in from the west in the late afternoon until the room was brimful of light. Finally, Bill rented a sander from Millsburg Plaza, and they took off the black floor paint down to the wide oak boards and refinished them. No rugs, Bill said. No, agreed Judy. It would be like putting a veil on the Mona Lisa. Then, when Bill and the children had finished razor blading the last bits of paint off the windows and washed the panes, they called Judy down from her upstairs study to come and see. The four of them sat down on the floor and gazed around. It was gorgeous. Leslie gave a deep, satisfied sigh. I love this room, she said. Don't you feel the golden enchantment of it? It is worthy to be. Jess looked up in sudden alarm. In a palace. Relief. In such a mood, a person might even let a sworn secret slip. But she hadn't, not even to Bill and Judy, and he knew how she felt about her parents. She must have seen his anxiety because she winked at him across Bill and Judy, just as he sometimes winked at Maybell or over Joyce Ann's head. Terabithia was still just for the two of them. The next afternoon, they called P.T. and headed for Terabithia. It had been more than a month since they had been there together, and as they neared the creek bed, they slowed down. Jess wasn't sure he still remembered how to be a king. We've been away for many years, Leslie whispered. How do you suppose the kingdom has fared in our absence? Where have we been? Conquering the hostile savages on our northern borders, she answered. But the lines of communication have been broken, and thus we do not have tidings of our beloved homeland for many a full moon. How is that for a regular queen talk? Just wished he could match it. You think anything bad has happened? We must have courage, my king. It may indeed be so. They swung silently across the creek bed. On the farther bank, Leslie picked up two sticks. Thy sword, sir, she whispered. Jess nodded. They hunched down and crept toward the stronghold like police detectives on TV. Hey, queen, watch out, behind you. Leslie whirled and began to duel the imaginary foe. Then more came rushing upon them, and the shouts of the battle rang through Terabithia. The guardian of the realm raced about in happy puppy circles, too young as yet to comprehend the danger that surrounded them all. They have sounded the retreat, the brave queen cried. We'll finish chapter 7 tomorrow.